Welcome to the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is Reverend Jennifer Innes. It is my great joy to be the minister with this congregation of fellow travelers in all the shapes, sizes, and seasons of life. In this congregation of people who are fully flawed and fabulous, as all humans are, we strive to put love at the center of all our efforts and aspirations. We are an intentional community gathered around our shared promise to support each other's spiritual journeys. So let us worship together all gender identities, sexual orientations, abilities, racial and ethnic identities, politics, all that we bring. May we root ourselves in the values of this faith, compassion and courage, transcendence, justice, transformation, and service. And as part of our network of mutuality, we honor our relations, past and present. This is the ancestral home of the Peoria people. They and other nations were here long before the Europeans arrived. We honor the Peoria people for who they were and for who they are today. And I want to welcome folks on this Easter morning. Uh, if you are a new or a recent guest, thank you for joining us in person or online. Please help us get to know you. We have plenty of name tags. Feel free to ask all the questions, because we do. And I invite you to remain after the service. Uh, join us for coffee and fellowship hall if you're with us in person, or chat on the Zoom after. And as we prepare ourselves to be present for this hour, I invite you to put your devices into worship mode, either vibrate or silent. And if you find you need a hearing device at any time during the service, please ask an usher or a greeter. Now today, uh, today is Easter Sunday, Easter Sunday, and it's a beautiful day to enjoy this day. And we also, just because, you know, I know this is going to be the most important piece for some of you, there is an egg hunt after the service. I mean, you know, come for the, come for the chocolate, kids, come for the chocolate. And cookies, we got cookies going on too. We have like a lot of good stuff. Um, as part of our practice as a faith that finds truth in many sources, we are spending this moment on this day in the deep story of Jesus's life and death and beyond. I also recognize that we come to this from many different places, theologically, religiously, or not. This is a holy day in the Christian tradition so however you understand that, I, under, I invite you to enter and be open to what may speak to you in the music and in the wisdom of sources, both ancient and modern. And now I'd like to invite uh, Lindy Peterson up for a message from our annual campaign. Good morning. So my name is Lindy Peterson. Um, I do a lot of things around the church, but right now I'm also the vice president of the board. Um, I was asked to remind everybody that pledge packets are in Fellowship Hall. You can pick them up under your name or you can get a blank one if you can't find one with your name on it or you need a blank one. Uh, any packets that aren't picked up this week are going to get mailed out. Uh, so save us a stamp and pick it up on your own if you can. So now that I've said that, uh, I wanted to talk about why I'm hoping that you will pick up your pledge packets and that you will fill them out and bring them back in. Um, so I started coming to this church when my brother was in Boy Scouts. Uh, he was working on becoming his Eagle Scout. So for people who don't know, Eagle, it's the highest rank in the Boy Scouts. Uh, it's the only rank you don't age out of when you turn 18. It's a really big deal. There's all this stuff you have to do. Um, but believe it or not, the hardest thing, most people, the hardest thing is a service project. They have to design it and lead it. For my brother, the hardest thing for him, or the most problematic, was an Eagle Scout has to do his duty to God. Uh, and in his understanding, it was ma made clear to him that his review board was going to take that requirement seriously, and they weren't going to let it slide. Uh, and at that point, I think the only religious services our family had been to were some weddings and some bar and bat mitzvahs, and that was it. Um, we were kind of at a loss about what to do about this. And fortunately, one of my dad's friends told him about the UU Church. He assured us that they would be cool with what we wanted uh, and that we were going to fit right in. So 
We showed up on the Darwin Sunday, the year before my brother turned 18. Zach joined the high school RE group and my parents and I started to go into all the things and helping out with all the stuff. Uh, and my dad's friend was right. Uh, we did fit in. Um, we figured, you know, we, we were coming just to tick off some requirements for my brother's Eagle Scout uh, and wanted to give back. So we were doing stuff. And over the course of the next year, yeah, we fit in. Zach completed his service project. He built the bridge out to the South Grove in the woods out here. Uh, and he held his Eagle ceremony right here in the sanctuary. And I know that this is sort of an unusual come to you use story. It's not the soul searching, looking for a spiritual home kind of place, but it was really meaningful to me. Um, becoming an Eagle Scout, it's a complicated process for a teenager. It's usually the most important thing they've done in their lives up to that point. And my brother was, let's see, what am I trying to say? It's a big deal for a teenager. Like it's, it's a really big deal. Like you put it on your college applications, you're an Eagle Scout forever. Um, and my brother was in danger of being told that he wasn't good enough, that that was not something that he could do. He'd been raised, our family had raised him and me outside of a traditional church structure to be good people. And we were being told that wasn't good enough. But we came to this church, the congregation welcomed us in and told my brother that he was good enough. This congregation supported us when you barely even knew us and you gave us something we couldn't do for ourselves. And it, it was a big deal to us. Um, and that was almost 15 years ago, but I've stuck around because yes, I like you guys. Yes, I agree with the UU theology, but mostly I think we need to be here for people like we were, people who didn't know that we were here. I'd been in Peoria for more than 20 years, never heard of this place. And I want to make sure that we can do that for other people. I want to make sure that we can still offer support for people, that we can be a welcoming community um, and offer that kind of acceptance that you can't find anywhere else. So I hope you guys feel the same way and that you'll help me to keep our church going strong for the next year. Thank you, Lindy. And let me offer, no, the part of the reason why we have, well, the reason why we have cookies after the service is because we made the first goal in our annual campaign effort. We are well over $100,000 at this point. So come and have cookies after service and help us celebrate. The next goal is pie? Ice cream. Sorry. I'm ambitious. I'm looking forward to the pie because we're going to get there too. But the next one, when we hit $200,000, we're going to have an ice cream party. So wait and see, come and help. And now I want to invite us to say hello for a moment with each other. Part of how we welcome is we share a moment of greeting with our neighbors during the service. I invite you to say hello in the sanctuary or online. And as we are a covenantal and consensual kind of community, please ask before offering a hug or a handshake. I will bring us back with the first verse of our gathering song. Please go forth and greet your neighbor.
rejoice and come in. Enter, rejoice and come in. Today Okay. Enter, rejoice and come in. Ooh, I think you all got it. I'm going to ask you to please rise and body your spirit. I know you just sat down, but please rise and body your spirit for our opening hymn. Number 38, Morning Has Broken. Please turn to number 38 in the gray hymnal if you want to follow with the music or let us enjoy the slides together. Please listen through and then we'll sing all the verses. Number 38. Let me invite Michaela Thomas forward for our opening. Good morning. <laughs> we live in a paradox. Humans generally don't like to admit it. We much prefer tidy, stable, comprehensible, logical ways of getting through the day. But paradox is woven into the fabric of this particular universe we inhabit. Light is both a particle and a wave. Imaginary numbers describe the math of the physical phenomenon. Love and grief are linked as are rage and sorrow. <laughs> Suffering and compassion, life and death. Time itself is both linear and circular. Each person's life traces a single arc, yet patterns emerge and reemerge. Fear always seems to return. Goodness knows terror finds its way back into the news. We all seem in need of help to roll back big stones that block our way. Yet we all come, yet we also come back to the Alleluia, even if its absence has been gone longer than the 40 days of Lent. We raise each other's spirits when our sacred places seem empty. We anoint each other. We engage in demanding faith that asks us to love the, the next world into being today. We are joyful though we have considered all the facts. We practice resurrection. It is Easter again, my friends, and you are surrounded by a multitude who wish you well. I invite the Cardanaway family forward to light our chalice. For Holy Days on Which We Recall the Old Stories by Reverend Dillman Baker Sorrells. 
for holy days on which we recall the old stories, we light the flame. For Passover, which reminds us of the courage and strength of those seeking freedom in the past, we light the flame. For Easter, which reminds us that love is our greatest challenge, we light the flame. For gathering today in this sacred place, we light the flame. For the opportunity to be together as a community, to remember the past, to plan for our future, to be alive in our present. And now we have the gift of music from Edith and Wes. Not me. Oh, Wes. We get a Wes solo. Excuse me. My apologies. As part of the support and continuous fulfillment of our mission and ministry together, we offer something of our lives in so many forms. A little bit of time, a little bit of talent, and a little bit of treasure. And we do that during service that we may do so intentionally in recognizing and celebrating 
and practicing the act of giving. And we also, we also in doing this, send some of what we receive, we send some of that out into the world in our, from our offering. We practice a share the plate, which is that half of our undesignated offering, so if it's not your pledge or something else, half of that will be shared with our named recipient for the month and half will go to the workings of the congregation. And for April, our share the plate recipient is the Central Illinois Center for the Blind and Visually Impaired. And this organization has been providing support and encouragement to the blind and visually impaired since 1955. And they teach Braille, they'll set up households, they'll provide assistive technology and offer other services, including social events and outings. Um, I will offer that it is so powerful, as we're talking about living into being welcoming and inclusive, that part of what that looks like also is to make sure that people have access, that people have agency, that people are able to conduct their lives as they wish. And this kind of organization really makes that possible. And this group is also one that doesn't receive government funding. It is a 501c3 charity. Um, so I want to invite us, uh, as you were so moved, uh, to be generous in the gift for today. Um, again, half of the undesignated offering goes to the Central Illinois Center for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Um, if you are using an envelope, uh, please mark, uh, or a check, please mark in the memo line, uh, whether it's your pledge or whether for the offering. If you're giving a little extra, that is also welcome as well. And just thank you. Thank you for all the gifts that you offer to help make what we do in here and what we can offer out there all possible. Now the ushers will come forward during our music for meditation. After the plates have passed during the music, folks are welcome to come forward and light candles of care. And now will the ushers please come forward.
spirit of community in which we share and find strength and common purpose. We turn our mind and hearts toward one another, seeking to bring into our circle of concern all who need our love and support, those who are ill, those who are in pain, either in body or spirit, those who are lonely, those who have been wronged. We bring into our circle of care all who celebrate in this moment of, as well that joy may be amplified when it is known. Now is the time for the sharing of joys and sorrows in the congregation. And I'll offer this one as maybe more of an announcement because that's what we do sometimes. There will be folks who are gathering at the Olive Garden at 3 o'clock this afternoon for Easter brunch. Everybody is welcome. Go for the Olive Garden. See Jean Jost if you are interested. I also want to share we have an upcoming joy uh, that Carol Lowe will be having a bit of a birthday celebration um, where she lives in Lutheran Hillside Village on April 19th. Please see the notices for more information. And now let's continue with our uh, good wishes. We offer good wishes to Phyllis and Jim Close as they adjust to their new residence in independent Independence Village, congratulations for making the move. That is a joy. We also offer a note of congratulations to Dr. Channing Petrak, who is the medical director for Peoria's Pediatric Resource Center. She was nominated and selected as Central Illinois' Most Remarkable Woman. Wow. She offers care and comfort and courage to help children who have endured situations that nobody should experience. So congratulations to Channing. We offer a note for speedy recovery to Nancy Venzon. Uh, she is at home recovering from her third surgery, which was on March 31st. Phone calls are welcome, but Nancy really appreciates visits, in case you were wondering. And we offer a note of sorrow to uh, the family and friends of Tessa Sutton. She was a 17-year-old young woman who uh, just died after a long, a long struggle and battle with cancer. We offer our note of condolence and sympathy to Tessa Sutton's family and friends. And now I offer, invite you to enter into one more moment of quiet among us, one more moment of recognizing the joys, the sorrows, the names, the milestones that are with us, but remain unspoken. Let us take this moment, present moment, to recognize the fullness of our lives and to do so within this circle of care. I invite you to pause in the quiet and breathe. Namaste. And let me invite Jesse Lachlan forward for our story. Good morning. Good morning. This morning, the story I'm offering is Meet Jesus. It's adapted from the book by the same name uh, by Lynn Tuttle Gunny. This is a story of Jesus, a beloved teacher. Although he lived over 2,000 years ago, his lessons of love and kindness still bring hope and joy to people all over the world. His father and mother, Joseph and Mary, 
raised Jesus in the traditions of their Jewish faith. Jesus felt a strong connection to God. He began to sense that God had called him to bring a new message of love, hope, and forgiveness. When he grew up, he began to travel and tell people his ideas. Soon, crowds were gathering to hear him preach. Jesus didn't work alone. He had friends, disciples that traveled with him as they walked from village to village, sharing their new ideas with anyone who wanted to listen. Jesus said we should love one another because God loved us. Jesus taught that God loves each of us, even if we make mistakes or we do something wrong. Mothers and fathers brought their sons and daughters to come meet Jesus. Let the little children come to me, he said. He believed that we should love one another, even those who aren't our friends. Treat everyone the way you would want to be treated. We call this lesson the golden rule. And as he went from village to village, he reached out to help sick people get well, to feed those that were hungry, and he treated all people the same, men and women, rich and poor, Jewish and non-Jewish, good and bad. By now, he had many followers. Some people worried the crowds that had gathered to hear him would get out of hand. And when Jesus and the disciples gathered for the Jewish holiday of Passover that year, Jesus blessed the bread and wine that they had. He said, may peace be with you to his disciples. Jesus asked them to remember his lessons no matter what happened to him. Today, that meal is known as the Last Supper. In some churches, people share bread and wine as a way to remember it. After the Last Supper, things started happening very fast. Jesus was arrested by soldiers. They said he was stirring up trouble. And in those days, the worst criminals were punished by being nailed to a wooden cross and left to die. Jesus was punished in this way. After Jesus died, his followers carried on his teaching and honored his memory. His message of love and kindness spread all throughout the world. Some people said that Jesus was the Son of God, and they started the Christian religion with that belief. Some said that after Jesus died, God brought him back to life, and that resurrection is celebrated today on Easter Sunday. Many Unitarian Universalists say that Jesus was a wise and beloved teacher. Whether or not he was the Son of God, they say it's important to remember him because he taught us to treat people with love, to stand up for peace and justice. They believe that now, 2,000 years later, we can still learn from the life and lessons that Jesus taught. We can celebrate the life of Jesus on any day by trying to live as he did, with full hearts, loving words, and kind actions. I wonder how you will live that message of love. I invite all the kids to join me as we make our own Easter bonnets and we'll be hunting eggs after worship.
Our reading today comes from the book of Mark, chapter 16. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so they may, that they may anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? But, but then they looked up and they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. And as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were startled. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, go and tell the disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as I told you. And trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they, they were afraid. Here ends the reading. Please rise in body or spirit for our next hymn, number 108, My Life Flows On, an Endless Song. The lyrics are on the screen. You may turn to 108 in the gray hymnal if you'd like the music. We will listen once and sing through the verses. Please be seated. For this moment, I want to begin about a week ago with Palm Sunday, and which is known as 
Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem, as the Christian scriptures tell us. From the book of Zechariah, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. From the book of John, we hear, the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took the branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. So here we are. Here we are. We start the lead up into this moment with the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem in all of the welcome and the enthusiasm and the greeting with the palms, but also in the riding of the donkey in defiance and tweaking the nose of the empire to say that the king can come on the humblest of creatures. Here we are with this story that began with a child celebrated at his birth, marked by the cosmos with a guiding star, whose parents were so humble that they took shelter in a barn, who had wise people, royalty, attend his birth, and then skirted around going back to the empire because they knew how precious this child was. And this child grows into a man, a teacher, as well as a carpenter, performing miracles of healing, feeding the people when there was no food, teaching lessons of morality again in living into the spirit of things, not just the rigors, and making people think about their place in society. He turned the value of wealth itself on its head and proclaimed who would ultimately inherit the world. I'm going to give you a hint. It wasn't the people with money and power. So here he is, this Jesus, entering Jerusalem, coming to make good trouble. And here we are a week later, and he has been arrested and executed. And here we are trying to make sense of the story that also says that the stone was rolled away and that Jesus was no longer there in the tomb to be found. When I come to the moment of considering Easter, I think for me, it's one of those annual touchstones, if you will. It is such a powerful story. The powerful story of the triumph of death, of the triumph of life over death in so many ways, of subverting expectations, of challenging what was status quo. And I cannot help but ask, as we come to another Easter and then go beyond it, what will be different this year? What will change in my own heart and actions? What will change in our hearts and our actions as a result of this flipping the tables? In this suffering, in this triumph, in this death, what happens then? Unitarian Universalism I will offer, comes directly from the Protestant faith, not just with our structure of hymns and uh, sermon and worship, but more from our theology. The earliest teachings of what became the Christian church included that there is one God, that, teacher, that Jesus was not divine or fully divine, and that Jesus' sacrifice was um, a gesture of solidarity for all of us to recognize how we all suffer. 
in managing our mortal, finite lives. And these teachings keep coming back in Western human history over all of these thousands of years. No matter what was made official, what was officially said, this is the, what's going to be taught, no matter how much uh, these remarkable, inclusive ideas were kept popping up, uh, no matter the oppression, they kept showing up and they have kept been coming down to us in the course of our history. So in this moment, I invite us to spend time with one of these more transformational stories of our past and our present and our culture and indeed the theology of this time and this faith. Because I'll tell you, my favorite stories of all the Jesus stories is when he subverts expectations. And not just because it's kind of fun to mess with the system, right? Because, amen, it's fun to mess with the system, right? Just because sometimes. But because that disruption can lead to insight, can lead to truth, can lead to opportunity. But it also can lead to more compassion, more recognizing how much we are, in fact, each other's neighbors, it can lead to somebody, maybe even ourselves, being made more whole and more able to live with hope, even amidst all the struggles. Jesus uh, flipping, he goes on after Palm Sunday, he goes to the temple uh, where there's an enormous amount of money changing and buying of selling of materials so that one can have the right things to take to the temple to offer sacrifice and so on. And he is enraged by what he is observing as the commercialization and commodification of faith and of ritual that is meant to be a source of comfort, that is meant to be a strength of the people. We're not, they, you know, the, they were not to make the temple, uh, you don't build a temple, you don't build a sacred structure for its own glory, for its own uh, monetary design but to locate sacredness, to make the ineffable more tangible for mere mortals. But, but in this observance, in this practice, it was turned into a source of profit rather than prayer. And so Jesus flips the table and said, this is not how this temple should be. And I'll offer, it is in that moment a bit of a violent act it is really a powerful and violent act. And we'll have another sermon about Jesus' anger at another time. That one I'm looking forward to. But much more prevalent are the stories of where he's flipping the expectations in the society and in the law. And I want to give one example of this in particular. And I take this from uh, the Christian teacher of nonviolence, Walter Wink. And he has quite the list of them, but I'll talk just a little bit about the one about debt and about the call when someone is, um, when Jesus said, if someone asks for your garment, you not only give them your cloak, but your, but your tunic as well. And this, and this, in case you don't know, you know, cloak and tunic in amongst the masses, amongst the general people, this is a two-item of clothing community. There's no under the tunic, right? You have a cloak, you have a tunic, and that is all you got. But what's he doing with this? Unfortunately, the reality of this time in the Roman imperial day and policy was the amount of debt incurred and enforced upon the people because they were taxed very heavily, um, and you couldn't necessarily relinquish, they couldn't make a peasant relinquish their land, because land was passed down from generations, but they could enact a tax that would impoverish them deeply and would force people to give up their land in that way. Sound familiar? Hmm, taxes, and economic systems such that people could not have property and wealth and power of their own. 
not just 2,000 years ago, kids. It's so advanced in this time. And the people who felt that the greatest were, of course, the most impoverished. So you have the folks who are called before the debt collector. And they could give up, they could be asked to give up their outer garment, but they have it back when they, at night, so they could have something to sleep with. But here is Jesus. Here is Jesus saying, if anyone's going to sue you, then don't just give them the one thing they're asking for, give it all. Because in this time, in this time, it was more, seeing somebody naked was more shameful for the person witnessing it than for the person who had nothing on. So in removing everything and handing it over, you're actually, they are actually covering the debtor in shame. They are making the debtor more uncomfortable. I have that a little hard to believe, but I'm going to go with it right now. And so here's the tables turned on the creditor. And the person in debt had no hope. They had no hope of winning this. The law was entirely in the creditor's favor. But here is this poor person who has transcended this attempt to humiliate. He has risen above the shame and has registered a fabulous, stunning protest against the system that put him there in the first place. You want my robe that says, tear, take everything. Take it all. You've got all except my body. Now what are you going to do? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Imagine. Imagine the person then, the debtor Lynn, leaving the court in the birthday suit and friends and neighbors saying, what's going on? And the debtor explains, and then the procession that follows is more like the victory parade than the walk of shame. This is guerrilla theater. This is subverting the system. Now, I recognize we might not be ready to do such a protest out in the world. I recognize that as we're going forth and figuring out what, how to take the lessons from what Jesus is offering and put them into practice, that sometimes we don't actually know what to do. We've got this wise person in Jesus, he's doing great, but what do we do now, today? And that it's not just an easy yes to find a way to tweak and defy and resist what is harming us. The poem, I want to offer a poem, piece of poem from the rabbi Rachel Berenblatt called Ready about the flight of the Hebrews from Egypt as they sought to escape their enslavement. From the book of Exodus. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading bowls wrapped in their cloaks upon their shoulders. And the section of the poem reads, you'll need to travel light, take what you can carry, a book, a poem, a battered tin cup, your child strapped to your chest, clutching your necklace in one hot, possessive fist. So the dough isn't ready. So your heart isn't ready. So you haven't said goodbye to the places you hid as a child, to the friends who aren't interested in the journey, to the graves you've tended. But if you wait until you feel truly ready, you may never take the leap at all, and infinity is calling you forth out of this birth canal and into the future's wide expanse. Jesus had all these powerful stories of flipping perception, subverting expectations, but, but he wasn't ready when he entered Jerusalem. I mean, it was a triumph, it was a wonderful moment, but he wasn't ready to make his deepest commitment until later in the week, that Monday, Thursday, after he had eaten with his disciples and he was alone and abandoned and heartbroken in the garden. This is part of the, 
the conundrum, the puzzlement of what to do with Easter, what to do with all the teachings of Jesus. How do we make sense of this and bring it into our lives, knowing that we're not ready to in any one moment, that we get surprised by when we have to, when we must encounter something we don't expect. The women at the tomb, for example, when we're in our most difficult moment, what shall we do? So we've returned to the scripture story again and again, but not alone, we do so in company. Each of us has to make our own choice, but we don't have to do it by ourselves. We have among us the mutual potential of creative minds and searching hearts, even when, especially when, we are nervous and disrupted and unsure. And we do so in this gathering, hoping to be humble enough to hear what is broken, to hear what is hard to hear. I don't observe Lent or many of the specific practices of Holy Week, Palm Sunday or Monday, Thursday or Good Friday. Um, I recognize, but I don't always necessarily dig deep into the triumphant entry, the Last Supper with the disciples, the arrest in the garden, the torture, the crucifixion, or the rising of Christ. Because in my growing up in Unitarian Universalism, for me it was really about the teachings but, I, but that flipping the tables on life and death itself, that is something. That is something. And it takes time. The period of time of Lent reminds me of the value of spending enough time in the moment to understand where to go, how to make a commitment, how to show up, even when not feeling ready. How we navigate the human struggle with the greatest questions of life and death and meaning, how long it takes us to endure in fear and despair and powerlessness, even, even when we have to face the death of what we value most, what we hold closest to us, but how we also keep going, what gives us hope when we face the death of everything at times the end of life itself. How bewildered and frightened we can be like the women when they found that open tomb and the disappearance of their beloved teacher's body. They had been mourning and they had prepared a final act of love. But what they find is not death and burial and also not a merely return to life because that would be startling enough, they find this other path. They find this moment of existential liminality and chaos. No wonder they were bewildered. But from there, well, okay, first they run screaming from the tomb because, yeah, no surprise. But then they also go on the path of how to be willing and open and the figure out the lifting of the self and other. They are given an answer that flips expectations as their teacher had shown them all along. And they find a way to trust in that capacity, not just what he said, but their own. We do this. We do this in every given moment. Just some of the ways that we might do this in subverting expectations in our own lives of the medical, metaphorical flipping the tables, not just for the sake of drama, but to offer a radical response to the world, to say it is important to witness to the human right of existence as we are in all our colors and shapes and forms. We are going to say yes to access for health care, we are going to say yes to loving and cherishing the earth. That can be a radical place to come from these days, am I right? We are going to say we're okay with being humble and resist feeling insecure. We are going to say yes to creating a beloved community. 
Here's one of Jesus' great paradoxes was the bringing of the kingdom of heaven on earth. A kingdom that was in this time, this present moment, not just a future moment that you might be looking forward to, but now and among us if we perceive and act on it. Dr. King said the same, the creation of the beloved community. And we do so, we do so with the same spirit of tweaking from this great teacher with humor and play and creativity, because the empire can't take a joke. But it gives us life. And use the system that is before us to do so. We can live in solidarity with each other, not fear of the other or, or fear that those of us with privilege could, could lose if we're dismantled or embarrassed, if we hurt ourselves or others, if we just fail. We can remember again the accounts of Jesus messing with the system. In that two-garment world, we give up both and be naked and simply there. Mm -hmm. We can be present and accounted for in so many ways. Well beyond any one Easter. So let us live into let us live into that subversion of the world for the sake of all our well-being. Amen. Please rise and body your spirit for our closing hymn, number 61, Lo, the Earth Awakes Again. The music will be on number 61 in the gray hymnal if you'd like to follow. We will listen once and sing through the verses. Let me invite Michaela for sending our light into the world. When we take the fire from our chalice, it does not become less, it becomes more. And so we extinguish our chalice, but we take its light and warmth with us, multiplying their power by all our lives and sharing it with the world.
Blessed are the truth tellers and those that live authentically. Blessed are those that see the beauty in the broad spectrum of creation beyond the binary. Blessed are the advocates and allies, the resistors that pour out their hearts, willing to be wounded by the stones being cast by the very ones who took an oath to serve all equally. Blessed are those that rise each day to do it all again out of love. Blessed and blessed and blessed are we all. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin. Thank you. 